Welcome to another podcast from Dr. Crunch. Today, we're going to be talking about PE management in line with the latest guidance from BTS. PEs happen when you least expect them. And the most barn door presentation of PE can be something else altogether. Let's give you a scenario. A 30-year-old lady comes in feeling short of breath. It came on in a matter of seconds and started 40 minutes ago. Your lazy registrar has already dismissed it as an anxiety episode, seemingly based on the age and gender, so asks you as the junior to clerk her. Before clerking the patient, what should you do? Check the OBS. There's a respiratory rate of 22, SATs of 98% on air, blood pressure is 118 over 91, pulse of 82 beats per minute, temperature of 37.3. Do the saturations reassure you? Not at all. Uh, PE can be compensated for by hyperventilation. The better your respiratory function, the more you can disguise a PE in your OBS by compensating. This lady may actually be having a hyperventilation episode, but equally could be having a PE. Okay, let's skip to the history. What do you want to achieve by the end of your history, in particular for a suspected PE? Oh, there are three things. Number one, I want to work down a differential diagnosis for a sudden onset shortness of breath in a 30-year-old. This would include a PE, pneumothorax, anaphylaxis, panic attacks, and a foreign body in the respiratory tract. Asthma is also a possibility, but usually that would come on over minutes rather than seconds. The second thing I want to do is appreciate just how unwell the patient is right now. The OBS and the exercise tolerance would help be pretty helpful here. And if this is a PE, we also want to classify the severity of the PE. So for most of you, you'd firstly have a cardiac arrest and hopefully you'd be able to spot that. Um, and that would be treated by thrombolysis. If you're going to thrombolyse someone in cardiac arrest, you've got to continue CPR for an hour, at least, because it is a reversible cause. The next most scary would be a massive PE. That's defined as a PE, where the blood pressure is less than 90, or we've got a drop in the blood pressure of 40 millimetres of mercury lasting for 15 minutes. At this point, you want a senior to decide about thrombolysis, and we're not going to cover these in any more detail in this podcast. The next most scary one is a sub-massive PE, and that's when you've got any evidence of right ventricular strain or acute core pulmonary. And pretty much any other PE is non-massive. The third thing you need to work, find out from history is what the well score is for the PE. So you need to know the risk factors. Okay, your examination is unremarkable, except for the use of accessory muscles and a raised respiratory rate. How are you going to investigate PE? Okay, so there are probably three initial investigations you may consider. Firstly, a chest x-ray. That's justified in any sort of sudden onset shortness of breath. And it helps with, with the differential, in particular, for pneumothorax. In PE, you usually see nothing on the chest x-ray, but occasionally there's decreased vascular markings, atelectasis, or a small pleural effusion. Occasionally you get this late sign, um, the so-called Hampton's hump, which is that wedge-shaped infarct you read about. It's basically an ice cream cone with the vanilla ice cream bit kind of towards the hilum and the cone part towards the edge. Uh, You can have an ECG. Uh, That classically would show uh, the S1, Q3, T3, but that only happens in about 10% of cases, and that's actually a sign of acute core pulmonale, not specifically PE. You'd also get that in pneumothorax or bronchospasm. The most common ECG finding is just sinus tachy, and the next most common thing would be uh, T-wave inversions in the anterior leads. Now, echo could also be used, and it would show right ventricular compromise if it's a big PE. In fact, if you've got a massive PE, then echo can actually be diagnostic as an alternative to CTPA, it would show right wall mesis, which is also known as McConnell sign. So these are the three kind of imaging style investigations uh, you could use. An ABG might also be done in a breathless patient if you're not quite sure of the cause in particular. And you might have reduced PaO2, reduced PaCO2, uh, and that would reduce PaCO2 because of hyperventilation. Okay, you mentioned a well score earlier. What's that? Well, a well score is a way of working out the risk of PE. So whenever you're organ, organ, blah, choosing any investigations, you need to document a well score. There are, you can look up the table for yourself, but briefly, uh, the first two scoring points are worth three, and that's for DVT, or any alternative diagnosis being less likely than PE, or in other words, PE being the most likely diagnosis. So three points if you clinically suspect a DVT, and three points if PE is the most likely diagnosis. The rest of them, I kind of think of as this demonic Tim. And I just think, how would a breathless person say Tim? They'd say Tim. So that's T-I-H-H-M. So T, 
for tachycardia, I for immobilization or surgery in the last four weeks, uh, H for a history of DVT or PE, H for hemoptysis, and M for malignancy. And you'd be scoring 1.5 points for uh, tachy immobilization and history of DVT, and one point for hemoptysis or malignancy. You add them all up, and if it's between 0 and 4, then you say P is unlikely. If it's above 4, so that includes 4.5, uh, then it's considered likely. Okay, and how would the Wells score help you to decide about whether or not a D-dimer is justified? D-dimers are amongst the most abused tests in medicine. D-dimers would be raised in pretty much any cause of inflammation, uh, maybe a DIC or sepsis or trauma. Of particular note, malignancy, pregnancy and recent surgery are all risk factors for VTE, but they also cause raised D-dimers. So how does the Wells score help you? Well, if you've got a low or intermediate probability, then a negative D-dimer would rule out a, uh, a DVT or a PE. In general, for a high-risk patient, you'd proceed straight to imaging. There's no point doing a D-dimer. So just to clarify this, in general, low-risk patients can have um, a D-dimer done, and if it's negative, this excludes PE. If it's positive, further imaging is needed. If the patient is high-risk, or if D-dimers are positive, then you'd start heparin. Okay. And in what circumstances would you use unfractionated heparin? So the three main ones for PE are wherever you need, you think you might need rapid reversal, if there's impaired renal function, or if it's a massive PE. Otherwise, you'd use low molecular weight heparin. Okay. And what would you do next? Um, you get some imaging done as soon as possible. The BTS say within one hour for massive thrombolysis and within 24 hours for other PEs. CTPA is the gold standard, as long as renal function is okay and there's no metformin in the last 24 hours. You could use a VQ, VQ scan, uh, as long as you meet five criteria by the BTS. So number one, you obviously need the facilities on site. Number two, chest radiograph is normal. Number three, there's no significant symptomatic concurrent cardiopulmonary disease. Number four, you've got standard reporting criteria. And number five, if you do have a non-diagnostic result, you can follow. You would be. You would follow up with further imaging. Remember, VQ only gives you a low, intermediate, or high probability, whereas a CTPA gives you positive and negative. If you've got a clinical DVT, then a leg ultrasound can be used, and if that proves a, the presence of a clot, then that in itself is an indication to start anticoagulation. So there's no actual need to do the CTPA if there is a confirmed DVT, which would justify anticoagulation in itself. Um, of course, a normal ultrasound though should not be used to exclude. Um, subclinical DVT. And as for how long you should be on warfarin, I know you didn't ask, but I'm just jumping ahead now. Uh, then uh, you go to different places, you read different guidelines everywhere, but the BTS in the most recent one says that the standard duration for oral anticoagulation is four to six weeks if you've got a definite temporary risk factor, three months if it's your first idiopathic, and six months for pretty much all other scenarios. And your target's going to be two to three INR. So that concludes our podcast on pulmonary embolism. Thanks very much for listening. My name is Viral. And I'm Muna. And uh, if you like what we're doing, have a look at drcrunch.co.uk, where there's some SBAs, OSCEs, videos, general medical goodness. And also check out the blog drcrunch.wordpress.com for cases and stories about things we've seen. Mm-hmm.